Hello and welcome everyone to this special spooky Halloween webinar presented by the National Archives of Australia. Today you will be entertained by the archive staff from across our state offices who have delved into the darkest corners of the collection to bring you stories that will make your hair stand on end. Um, and please be aware some of today's stories do contain mentions of suicide and death. UFO and monster sightings, peculiar happenings along Australia's coastlines and mysterious deaths have all been uncovered. So lock your doors, turn the lights down low and get ready to be chilled to the bone by these terrifying tales from the archives. I would like to start with an acknowledgement of country. The National Archives of Australia acknowledges the traditional owners and custodians of country throughout Australia and acknowledges their continuing connection to land, sea and community. We pay our respects to the people, their cultures and elders past, present and emerging. If you have any questions during our session today um, for our presenters, you can pop them in the chat and I will read these out at the end of the presentation. I would now like to introduce our first presenter, Emily, from our Victoria office, who will leave you wondering, do UFOs really exist? Thank you, Taryn. So our first terrifying tale today is going to be the Valentich story. Now, Fred Valentich was 20 years old when he disappeared whilst flying a light aircraft over the Bass Strait on his way to King Island. Fred was studying to become a commercial pilot at the time and he had logged over 150 hours flying time and was also a member of the RAF Training Corps. Although Fred had previously failed some of his commercial piloting classes and he was only approved to fly at night in very clear conditions, one of his instructors had described his flying attitudes as a responsible attitude towards the command of an aircraft. Unfortunately, on Saturday the 21st of October in 1978, just over 45 years ago, Fred and his plane disappeared and they have not been seen since. Today I'll be talking about Fred's last flight, his odd radio transmissions and the belief of the public and his family that he may have been taken by a UFO. So on Saturday the 21st of October, Fred set out on his final flight. His destination was King Island and he told an officer at the Moorabbin briefing office that he would be picking up passengers at King Island and took along extra life jackets for the task. However, oddly enough, his family and girlfriend believed that he were going to the island to bring back crayfish and there's actually no evidence that any passengers were waiting for him on the island at all or any crayfish to collect either. These conflicting stories mean that no one knows the real reason that Fred was in the plane that night. Fred took off from Moravin shortly after 6pm and had a completely uneventful flight until shortly after 7. At this point, he asked Melbourne Flight Service if there was any known traffic below 5,000 feet and they responded in the negative. Fred then claimed he could see a craft nearby and then continued to discuss the unidentified craft, saying he didn't know which size it was due to the speed it was travelling at and asking Flight Service to confirm again if there were any aircraft, aircraft Air Force craft in the vicinity. Here we've just got a transcript of Fred's comms with flight service that night. So Fred said the craft was approaching him and he noted, it seems to me that he's playing some sort of game. He's flying over me two, three times at speeds I can't identify. Flight service were audibly confused and asked Fred to describe the aircraft. He said, it's a long shape. It's got a green light and sort of metallic. It's all shiny on the outside. Shortly after this, he told flight service, it seems like it's stationary. What I'm doing right now is orbiting and the thing is just orbiting on top of me. Less than a minute after this, Fred said the aircraft had vanished, then suddenly reappeared and was traveling towards him again. He explained his engine was rough idling and after a question about his intent from flight service said, my intentions are to go to King Island. That strange aircraft is hovering on top of me again. It is hovering and it is not an aircraft. That was Fred's last transmission and this entirely odd conversation had taken place over the course of only six minutes. An air and sea search and rescue turned up nothing and the situation officially became an accident investigation. 
Fred's family and friends provided mixed response when they were interviewed by staff undertaking the aircraft accident investigation report. His aircraft instructor, Captain Barnes, described Fred as friendly, neatly dressed and of sober habits. But after being told more detail about his confusing relationship with his girlfriend, that he had failed two flight exams and had no passengers waiting for him, subsequently wondered if he has absconded with the aircraft or if it was a suicide flight that he had carefully planned for some time. Fred's dad Guido said, Frederick worried about attack from UFOs and what they could do. He was absolutely convinced that his son was captured by a UFO and that he'll be returned when they had finished investigating him. His friend Gregory thought that it would be quite out of the question that Valentich would commit suicide or purposely fly the aircraft to a remote location to get away from society. He was far too close to his family, girlfriend and friends to contemplate such an action. The public obviously gobbled up the story and opinions varied with all different sorts of experts weighing in with different theories about what Valentich had seen that night or what had happened to him. Absolutely everything was suggested right through from birds, pyrotechnics, uh, searchlights from ships, the Aurora Australis and of course the big one, aliens. So what really happened that night? Air safety staff noted that the pilot's unusual description of events surrounding his flight was eagerly accepted by the local news media and inaccurately and grossly amplified reports were distributed around the world. It is most unlikely that the true state of the pirate's, uh, pilot's environment and personal problems will ever be known. In other words, the media had run with a good story and in doing so affected the chance of the truth really being discovered. The report also noted that if it had been the pilot's intention to disappear, there were a number of directions of, tra of travel open to him and that they noted while describing the unidentified craft, his voice remained matter of fact and completely normal. The final suggestions from the accident investigation report were UFO intervention, disorientation, a controlled sea landing, a successful landing elsewhere, or a crash while attempting to land with no wreckage found. What this means is that the Valentich story remains completely unsolved to this day and that there are multiple theories about what happened to him on that night, but no real answers. Uh, everything that I have just talked about in my little terrifying tailing, um, including quotes, are pulled from four records, which are digitally available on our website as well, if you would like to investigate further. For our next terrifying tale, I'll be handing over to Eve Terry from the Queensland office. Thank you, Eve. Thanks, Emily. I'll be sharing some of the tragic experiences suffered by those who saw Busted Head Lighthouse their home. Lighthouses are admired for their architecture and spectacular coastal locations, but they are also shrouded in mystery, death and tragedy. Most of the lighthouse records in our collection are from the 19th century, so we do have later records on the topic. These include drawings and plans, logbooks, visitors books and weather reports. Built in 1868, Busted Head just east of Gladstone is the second oldest light station in Queensland but it has more sobering claims to fame. Over the 118 years that the lighthouse was made, a remarkable number of tragedies occurred, so much so that there has been mention of the curse of the busted head lighthouse. Its first victim was a workman who suffered a blow to his head during the lighthouse's construction and died the following day. The next tragedy occurred in 1887. Kate Gibson, the wife of lighthouse keeper Nils Gibson, disappeared while on a walk. Her 19-year-old daughter Anne discovered her mother lying with an arm across her chest and a gaping wound in her neck. The family could only speculate on how she came to be in this condition. Kate was buried in the cemetery on Busted Head. Almost two years after Kate's death, Mills, his 20-year-old daughter Mary, assistant keeper John Wilkinson, his wife Elizabeth, and a telegraph repairman named Alfred Power set off from Busted Head on a sailboat to return the telegraph official home. They didn't make it far. When the boat was about 450 metres clear of the shore, Mills gave the order to John to tap so that they could get into smoother water. He succeeded after two attempts, but the boat began to tilt over. Some of the passengers stood up in a panic, 
causing the boat to capsize. Though there were valiant attempts by both Nils and John to save their loved ones, Alfred, Elizabeth, and Nils' daughter Mary did not survive. Mary's daughter, sorry, body, was never recovered. These are the headstones of Elizabeth Wilkinson and Alfred Power in Busted Head Cemetery. In 1906, Frederick Anderson arrived at Busted Head as head lightkeeper. Over time, he and his wife lost six of their children. When one of their daughters, Edith, turned 16, she went to work as a domestic servant at a cattle property known as Turkey Station. Here she became involved with another employee, George Daniels, but the Anderson family deemed them an unsuitable match. A man fond of Edith, Arthur Cogsell, escorted her on horse back to Busted Head. George Daniels followed them and shot and killed Arthur and then apparently left with Edith. Trappers could not follow the horse trail due to the abundance of rain. They later found the horse, but Daniels and Edith were never found, even after a 10 month search. Edith is seen here standing behind her father, who has the cap on, in 1908. This is an 1867 drawing of the building surrounding the lighthouse. In 1932, a fire destroyed cottage number two and three. The two assistant keepers and their families were forced to share the one remaining cottage for a couple of days before being evacuated to Gladstone. The keepers received no compensation, and it was several years before the Commonwealth could afford to replace the two cottages. On the 31st of March 1972, Cyclone Emily caused havoc for participants in the Brisbane to Gladstone yacht race, as winds reached up to 96 knots. This light station weather look shows the events of that day. The four-man crew of the Istria disappeared. The yacht Australian made found it just off Busted Head. Two of the five crewmen were washed ashore and knowing that the lighthouse was nearby, scrambled to the scrub to get there. Third crew member was found alive by one of the light keepers sometime later. A few months after Cyclone Emily had passed through, two inspectors from Harbours and Marine went missing. They were last seen on the morning of June 22nd, as they set off from near the lighthouse in their dinghy. Police began a search, with the lightkeepers being asked to keep a watch as well. The next day, the search party found a boot with the laces still done up and some clothing. A school of 30 to 40 sharks had been sighted offshore, and it was believed that the inspectors had fallen prey to the ocean's silent stalkers. And now to end with something a little silly. In August 1921, the main light at Bay Rock Lighthouse in Townsville mysteriously went out. This report details the inspector's findings. He writes, the only possible cause of the failure of the pilot flame was a large tarantula dead on the table. I could detect no trace of burning on the body or legs of the spider. I was forced to the conclusion that the spider by some means had extinguished the pilot flame. It was probably carried into the tower on the clothes of the men who were engaged painting the structure and made its way into the lantern. Imagine a spooky image of a giant tarantula crouched in the lantern being projected into the darkness. Thanks for listening to Queensland Spooky Stories. I'll now hand you over to Kelly from the South Australian office. Thanks very much, Eve. Hi, I'm Kelly from the South Australian office and my tale involves a solemn murder investigation and will definitely get you in the mood for Halloween. So this tale starts in October 1945 when a body washed up on the shores of the Port River in Adelaide. It was alleged that four nails were driven into the head of the victim. The body was wrapped in blankets and weighted with ship's banners. The discovery of the body triggers a police investigation that sees two Chinese seamen from the ship Helga Moller face trial for murder. Those accused of his murder, Lui Lung Fui and Wu Su Ling, 
had been allowed by the Australian Immigration Department to come ashore in Adelaide for the time the ship that they were working on was docked there. The permission to land came via a certificate of exemption from the provisions of the Immigration Act. The three month exemption period was given on the proviso that the men did not have a burden on state funds or any other charitable institution whilst in port. The first man accused, Lui Fung Hui, was employed as a ship's boy. The second man, Wu Sing Ling, held the position of engineer. From court records, Lu accuses Wu of being the chief instigator of the crime and asking him to help dispose of the body. He argued that he assisted only in wrapping the body in blankets, putting spanners inside the blankets, tying the body up and putting it overboard. He claims that at the time, he did not know there were any nails in the head of the victim. He said that Wu had later told him that he had killed Li by driving three nails into his head. Lu also claimed he saw Wu washing blood from the floor of their cabin. The case presented difficulties in securing a murder conviction. Both of the accused blamed each other for the murder and gave sworn evidence in court that the other was guilty of the murder. There was discussion that Wu Singling had motives of both a family dispute as well as a desire for the hundred pounds that the victim was carrying. Lui Lung Fui claimed that he only assisted with the disposal of the body at the request of Wu Singling because they were friends and Wu had threatened to kill himself if Lu did not assist with the dumping of the body. The court was able to prove that both men had participated in the disposing of the body, but the jury could not definitively say that either man was solely responsible for the murder itself. So the court finally ruled that both men were guilty of the lesser charge of conspiracy to defeat the course of justice by secretly disposing of the body of Li Pao Sung. These criminal charges represented a definitive contravention of the Immigration Act, and both men faced deportation after the completion of their respective jail sentences. At the time, the seriousness of the case saw the Adelaide Supreme Court open on a Saturday for the first time in 20 years. Lui Yung Fui served two years and nine months of his sentence of hard labour at Yatala Labour Prison in Adelaide with an early release for deportation. A deportation order was then raised with expenses to be paid by the British Shipping Company who had guaranteed his good behaviour whilst docked in Australian ports in return for his exemption from the Immigration Act. And we can see here, this is the final photo of Hui Lung Fung that was forwarded to Queensland Customs to enable them to identify him and ensure that he departed from the Australian shores. So that's the end of my spooky tale. And Nicholas Hams from our Tasmanian office is going to mystify you next with tales of the Tasmanian Globster. Thank you, Kelly. <clears throat> Now, while we're on the water, it does tie in with, with our story from the Tasmanian office. So it was serendipitous of me to stumble on the following records at a time of the year when the scary movies again start being recycled through our theatres. Welcome everyone, and thank you for coming. My name is Nicholas Hams and I'm in the Tasmanian office. So I invite you into our collection for a mysterious short while. Since beginning with the Tasmanian office in May of this year, I've been taken by the rich history of Lutruwita. There's been a lot to see and do since arriving. 
But fortunately, I've had the benefit of journeying around the state through our collection. And knowing this day was coming, I've been dying into, diving into some more peculiar consignments. And I began to see how strange discoveries and imaginative offerings may have come to be, soon becoming common knowledge and recurrent folklore. So our spooky record for today gives a blow-by-blow -blow account of the infamous Tasmanian sea monster discovery during the early 60s on the west coast of Tasmania, which if, many, if any of you don't know, it's a very isolated and visually spectacular place, a very eerie setting. But what was found further north on the beach will come as no surprise. So what I have on the screen here is the Gordon Dam. So the road to the southwest coast ends here and you can see, um, you can imagine what's in the waters north of it. So here's an idea of the geology and the remoteness of the area. And you can see here the road does stop, but also on this coastline, this blistering, that's the continental shelf, and that's been home to many other mysterious um, happenings in Tasmania. So you might have seen the Blythe Star in the news earlier this year, and that's where that occurred, not far from where we discovered the Globster. And here is the inspiration for today's talk, and these are the citations from our collection if you want to go and view them yourself. So here is an extract on the screen from our Mercury newspaper. So the creature, which is circled, was discovered by Mr. Jack Boot in the winter of 1960. Now, all we have is Mr. Boot's word, but he swears that whatever it was that he saw on that beach was in its entirety and like nothing he had ever seen before. And bear in mind, he would have been around water his whole life and he came from a family of fishermen. Now, of course, word didn't travel so fast back then, particularly on the west coast of Tasmania, but also when CSIRO had such reservations about investigating the discovery. Many CSIRO employees who crop up in our Globster records, which I showed on the screen before, considered the excitement and thought of an unpre unprecedented marine discovery to be fanciful. So the sea monster or globster was not actually scientifically examined till March 62, two years later. And by this point, of course, much of the globster had decomposed, leaving only remnants for testing. Scientific testing has suggested strong links to whale blubber, but many locals still hold strong in their belief. Was the West Coast sea monster another unsolved mystery of the sea, or was Mr. Jack Tool fooled by a trick of the light? The globster, as it came to be known, was a popular term circulating through scientific communities all around the world. In our collection, in those two records, many examples of correspondence between these interested parties and the CSIRO. And here are some descriptions that we've pulled from the record. And here's a sketch, once again, dragged from the Mercury newspaper in 62. So unsurprisingly, a young imagination was hooked from the beginning. A significant makeup of the original hysteria, which we alluded to earlier, was more often than not school, school students riding in from all around the world, desperate for any visual aid of the beast to pour over. There are numerous requests, also there are numerous requests for the monster to be tested for radioactivity, as at that time, there were thoughts that there might be a connection between 
the radioactive fish caught by the Japanese a couple of years previous to this discovery. Here it is in motion. Now we did reach out to our friends down the road at TMAG, which is the T Tasmanian Museum and Art Gallery. And they actually do have a sample if anyone uh, dares to come look at it when they're visiting. And we have a few takeaways from these records. So A, always remain open-minded. And a new word which I had never heard of before was the ballyhoo, which is the unnecessary noise and excitement. And this was used over and over by CSIRO employees at the time. Thank you. Now I'll introduce our next speaker, Rachel from the Sydney office. Hello everyone, and thank you very much for that. That was horrifying. So today I'm going to be looking at the vampire. So the vampire appears throughout time in spooky stories and tales to terrify. And over that time, the vampire also changes from a remnant of the night to a sparkling visage of beauty that we see here in this image. But did you know that in Australia, we were so frightened of the vampire and the rest of this monstrous family that horror films were banned for 20 years. So luckily the National Archives holds the censorship records and we can discover the vampires that are within them. So the ban started in 1948. And when talking about the genre of horror films, the chief censor at the time, Jay Alexander said, this type of film has no cultural or entertainment value, and its appeal extends only to a very limited section of the community, a section whose mental outlook should not be fed with films of this nature. In addition, such films are a source of potential danger to women in a delicate state of health. So that's there. You can see that there in the letter. And uh, we have here, a, uh, a woman clearly in a delicate state of health uh, from the film The Vampire Lovers uh, upon hearing the uh, chief census concerns. So in this letter um, that Alexander wrote, he clearly spelled out the ban uh, by also saying that, um, oops, sorry, I've skipped back. Uh, it has accordingly been decided as a matter of censorship policy that any film which would normally be classified as horror will in future be refused registration. And this is a memo from the minister at the time endorsing that decision. So what evidence can we see uh, of this attempt to protect us from the horror that is horror. So this is a, a record from our custom series and a distributor wants to import the film The Daughter of the Vampire in 1967 and this request has been rejected. So the ban was lifted in the late 1960s and there's a lot of different events that impacted this from court cases that were gauging what be, could be considered offensive to the modesty of the average man um, to a survey conducted by a schoolgirl in North Bondi about what her friends saw on TV. And so while that full ban was lifted, violent and explicit scenes were still trimmed from films and television shows before we were able to watch them. And so here I was going to show you clips um, from the censorship records that we have, but they're very short and so they're hard to make sense of. 
So it's actually easier to see the still Im images. So here's a picture of Peter Cushing, a famous actor for his roles in horror films, but also in Star Wars. And you can see across his face, there is a cross and it was the sensor marking this scene for removal. So when you start looking through all the censorship clips and all the footage, you see a pattern in what was removed. So I'll show you some of that now. So we have vampires with their fangs getting ready to attack. And here's another vampire with their fangs getting ready to attack. And also you can see there the censorship mark. We then also have lots of pretty young ladies about to be attacked. So here's one young lady. Here's the lady we saw before. Another lady about to be attacked. Another lady about to be attacked. Then we also have a series of men valiantly hunting and killing vampires and being very sort of emotional about the process. So here we have a man here being valiantly uh, killing vampires. Another man very distraught about killing vampires. And one of my favourite scenes that I saw. Um, so this is from the Vampire Lovers. And this is a, a priest uh, valiantly killing and hunting vampires. And he's very covered in blood and very distraught about the whole thing. And then we have a selection of scenes about vampires being very shocked that they're dying. Because, of course, they're immortal. So it always comes as a surprise. So here we have one vampire being very shocked that it's going to die. Another vampire very shocked it's about to die. And here we have a couple of stills from a sequence. This is a film called Dracula Has Risen from the Grave. He's uh, waking up to a surprise stake. He is writhing around on the stake. And then he is crying tears of blood as he dies. So come in to the New South Wales office or look online and examine the very exciting censorship clips that we have. And so finally in our series today, we have Kelly from Western Australia to talk about alchemists. Rachel. North of Perth, 200 metres offshore, the remains of the SS Alchemos lie in its shallow ocean grave. The Greek owned merchant ship met its grim fate in 1960, but it was no quick death for this freighter, which has become known as one of Western Australia's most. Sorry, Kelly, I might just have to get you to turn your mic up, maybe. Just can't hear you. Thank you. I didn't have my mic down. <laughs> All right. So we've got the Alkamos, one of the most haunted sites in Western Australia here. And you got to see some more of this nice footage that I found on YouTube. In March 1963, the Alkamos was sailing from Jakarta to Bunbury in southwestern Australia when it hit a reef off Lehman. No lives were lost, but the ship was thought to be a total loss. However, in what was described as a masterpiece of marine salvage, a Lloyd salvage expert had her prized from the pinnacles of the rock which held her, according to a newspaper. He may have later regretted not leaving the fracture captive to the reef. The wounded ship was towed to Fremantle for repairs. After two months, preparations were being made to tow the Alchemos to Hong Kong but a dispute over payment for repairs temporarily consigned the ship to Limbo. When the dispute was settled, a tug, the Pacific Reserve, arrived to tow the freighter. Only 50 odd kilometres into the journey, the vessels were caught in an 80 kilometre an hour gale. The tow line gave way as the tug was almost dragged beneath the waves. The Alchemos washed ashore at Eglinton Rocks. Attempts to refloat the freighter several weeks later were thwarted by heavy seas. By now it was winter and so the Alchemos was left where it lay. The following January, another tug named the Pacific Star arrived to refloat the Alchemos. On the first attempt, a sudden gust caused the tow line to get caught in the tug's propeller and it was beached next to the freighter. By mid-February, however, the Pacific Star had freed not only itself but the Alchemos and departure seemed imminent for the ship that apparently refused to go to sea. But what happened next, I'll quote from the Canberra Times. 
Out of the darkness on the morning of February 21 came the fishing boat Aurora Australis. With all the urgency of a commando raid, the fishing boat drew alongside the Pacific Star and an armed police party climbed aboard. The tug was seized, sailed to Fremantle and arrested by the Marshal's deputy of the Admiralty Court. The tug's owners were served with a writ for money owed to the Bank of America. The Alchemos was abandoned at anchor at Eglinton Rocks. On the 2nd of May 1964, almost a year after first hitting the reef, the Alchemos broke anchor and again ran aground off the beach. And this time there would be no resurrection. The freighter's seemingly inexorable drive to ruin was finally fulfilled. In the years since, the story of the cursed ship Alchemos has grown and spread like barnacles on a submerged hull. It was originally a Liberty ship named the MV George M. Shriver, built in Maryland, US for use as a troop and cargo transport. According to the ship's law, a welder, or perhaps two, was trapped within the hull and accidentally sealed in, their anguished cries unheard until it was too late. Only months later, the ship was reassigned to the Norwegians and renamed the Vigo Hunstein. In August 1944, a Canadian radio operator, Maud Steen, was reportedly shot dead by one of the Norwegian crew, who then killed himself. The incident was supposedly so horrific that it was covered up, with Maud's family told that she had been killed by enemy fire. Marine superstition holds that it is unlucky to rename a ship. Fate was tempted twice in this case, with the Vigo Hanstein sold after the war and renamed the Alchemos. Even after the ship met its demise on a beach north of Perth, the curse of the Alchemos continued. Long distance swimmer Herbert Voigt disappeared in 1969 while attempting to swim from Cottesloe Beach to Rottnest Island. At night, apparently after a few drinks at the pub. A skull identified as his was found on the beach near the Alchemos some time later. Some reports even say the remains were found in the engine room of the ship itself. Locals reported strange lights, mysterious cooking smells and odd noises from the wrecked ship. Horses on the beach reportedly bolted when they approached the freighter. Dogs would turn heel at the sight. Author Jack Sue was hospitalised with a serious mystery illness after publishing his book, Ghost of the Alchemos. Records created by the Customs Department held by the National Archives reveal that its officials also suffered from the curse of the Alchemos. From the moment the ship was stuck at Eglinton in May 1963, these wretched public servants were haunted by paperwork. With the freighter stuck in Australian waters, everything aboard was considered dutiable and pages and pages of lists were guaranteed or generated to calculate everything from the duty payable uh, from, on gravy bowls and pillows to lifeboats and copper piping. As well as drowning in paperwork, customs officers had to keep watch over the freighter in shifts 24 hours a day to ensure nothing was removed. Their reports contain no supernatural happenings, unfortunately, just crowds of Perth locals gathered on the beach to view the most exciting thing to happen in the city since the 1962 Commonwealth and Empire Games. Much of the freighter was dismantled and removed to be sold as scrap. In a minute dated July 1967, the collector of customs was advised. After many years, the wreck, the wreck Alchemos has been brought to a satisfactory conclusion. The relief at being free of the cursed ship was palpable. For many years, the Alchemos wreck was visible from the beach. Now, however, only the tip of the engine block sits above the surface. So, if you dare dive the ghost ship Alchemos, beware of the curse. You might encounter not only the spirit of Maud Steen or the ill-fated welder, but the tormented soul of an overworked public servant from the Department of Customs. Thank you. Thanks everyone for joining us today.
for our exploration of the strange and spooky side of the National Archives collection. You can visit our website and research some mysteries of your own on our database record.